Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your, your love for us, for your grace. We want to exalt you tonight. Father, I pray that we would love each other, but that that love would be not greater than our love for you, that we would cherish your word above all else, that we would exalt your word. Father God, may we fear you more than anyone else. I pray now as we finish this semester, I pray that the students would really uh, feel good, be able to finish this semester, Father. I pray that there'd be understanding and clarity and that uh, we would continue to grow in grace and understanding that EVST would be successful. And I pray for the students to finish strong. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things in faith. Amen. Okay, so we have the rest. We have people coming in. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead. Let's look at this uh, PowerPoint. Essentially, what I want to do, because we kind of closed, we closed the class last week. We did a lot. There was a lot of questions. When I went back and I edited the video, I edited the video and I saw, you know, hindsight's always 2020. And, you know, I looked back and I felt that maybe sometimes my some of my answers made might have been deficient. So I do want to just highlight and summarize what we discussed. Maybe you want to ask follow-up questions. I want to make sure that everyone is understanding the content that we discussed. I don't want to lose anybody. So I really feel we there was one passage that we did not get to. And so um, I do I do want to touch on that passage tonight. So that would be the primary content of, of, of the class. So, so my goal is just we will end biblical theology. This will become a biblical theology part one. And then biblical theology part two will we'll deal with the, the ceremonial law and also um, uh, the second half of, of, of um, Voss's book. Most likely we will teach that in the fall. I just really, I feel as if we were slow. We had issues with internet and I don't want to rush. I want there to be understanding. I feel, I feel that as, as if we rush, there won't be understanding. And I, I understand that, I understand that maybe there's some disagreement, but I really want people to understand what Voss is trying to teach. It's definitely not the clearest. Um, so let's go ahead, let's look at this PowerPoint and then we'll get into that last passage of scripture. So again, we just wanna thank Converge, Cebu Graduate School of Theology and EVST for making this possible. And uh, we're on to the last session for the semester. So the content of special revelation during the Mosaic period, uh, Mosaic era, it's either part five or part six. I think it's part six. Um, uh, part six in the video sessions, part five in the PowerPoint. So we have to, I have to tighten the ship on that part to make, uh, to, to be more consistent there. Uh, brief overview of the session. We will review the calendar of just the events. We will also review the assignments. Uh, we might not do that. Um, we, 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 we'll do that at the end. We'll discuss the, the end. Let, let, I want to get to the notes first, but then we'll discuss the, the assignments at the end. And then there will be a conclusion and prayer. But we'll do, we'll do the reviewing of the assignments at the very end so that when we leave, we have understanding. So just brief uh, calendar. So uh, this does not apply for anybody. So May 7th is not applicable. That's already passed. So that was for anyone graduating, but no one's graduating. This is the last week. So what I will do, for the final, I'm just, it's the final is going to be some of the same questions from the midterm, and I'm going to add a couple questions. One of the questions will be from our discussion from last week, so it is important for you to, if you missed the session from last week, to watch it again. It is important for you to, to pay attention here, um, and I will ask the same question. So if you understand what's going on and you just answer the question, that's, that's credit there. Um, all assignments now for CGST, EVST, I'm, there is maybe still grace, but all, all assignments for all assignments for CGST have to be into me by May 26. There is no, they, it just has to be. You, you, you cannot uh, submit after because they have to have the CHED submittal right around that time. So if it's not in by May 26, that's it. Um, so most of you at CGST, CGST are, are, are getting there. There's one or two of you that have 
Vin Kulang, um, but you know who you are. And so if you want to talk to me about a plan, uh, you can um, talk to me after the class tonight. And then uh, May and June, I know some of the EBS students, EBST students are behind. So for the four classes that we taught, hermeneutics, Bible's big story, biblical theology, redefining leadership, redefining leadership will, be, will end at the end of May. And then all of June and possibly into July, I'm going to help everyone get caught up. If you want to take it for credit, I will help you get caught up so that you can, you can receive credit for each of those courses because the assignments are important. So um, I have to post, I think, one or two videos for hermeneutics, one or two for Bible's big story. So what we need to do is we need to, um, there needs to be a catch up there. So we will work in June to get everyone caught up. This is part of the beauty of not being under a CHED or depth ed that um, we can we can help. We, we don't, no one really gets left behind. We can work to get them caught up. So May and June is going to be a time of regrouping and also of getting caught up. Okay, from last week's discussion, I have some conclusions listed here. I, I do want you to, if I, I want, People who maybe did not understand, or maybe there, I did look back at, um, at, at, I edited the video, I posted the video from last week, and I felt that at places, maybe I was talking past you, I wasn't really answering your questions. Uh, maybe by the end, you really felt that everything made sense. I don't know, but I don't want to take that for granted. So I want to review the conclusions that we made. I want you to ask a question. Um, I want there to be clarity because I think this is really important, okay? So just um, uh, really quick, just to review some highlights, we, we asked a question, what does the word fulfill mean? And we had, uh, we had discussed how um, really complete and accomplished, maybe they could be the same, but there's really three ideas that fulfill um, means. There's a semantic range. Okay, so when I say, so when I say there's a semantic range, there's a range of meaning here um, that, that range from, from complete to, to do, okay? So you can also have fill. There's a range of meaning, okay? And so um, uh, we, taught, we highlighted the fact that in the context, really these three were contained. Okay, so we talked about that. Um, moving along here, uh, we said that all of these senses are in relationship to the Mosaic law in the New Testament, both by Jesus and his church. So when we call Jesus, his name is Christ, the Jewish Messiah. So it's in this context, okay, of the Mosaic law, all right? Um, that's not to say that the Mosaic covenant is still in effect. It is to say that the... The, the, the Mosaic law, the eternal parts of it are still in effect, okay? So um, uh, any questions or comments or how about this? Let's work through the slides and then we can ask, okay? Then we can ask a question, okay? The, 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 the next thing, so this is, uh, this is a concluding statement from our discussion. This is a concluding statement from our discussion. I'm actually just taking it from the Reformation Study Bible. So if anyone knows of the Reformation Study Bible, this is the R.C. Sproul edited Ligonier Study Bible. He says that, um, it says that Jesus does not alter, replace, or, or nullify the former commands. Rather, he establishes their true intent and purpose in his teaching and accomplishes them in his obedient life. Okay, so that is a major truth, a major uh, observation conclusion that we sought to prove okay we sought to prove this and one place where we really saw that we saw it proven was in Matthew 7 12 so Matthew 7 12 is a fundamental text because there's a whole bunch of different you know there's a whole bunch of different people saying different things and um some people are posting on Facebook after the fact um but this passage is at the concluding of the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, I think it's fundamental. It's fundamental to everything that Jesus was saying, okay? So 
I'll just quickly highlight some things again. So we have this, this so is a, an inference. And then this is a qualification. Um, whatever, so this, this could be a qualification here. Whatever you wish others, that others would do to you, then we have the command. Do also to them. Okay, so this is this is a, this is a command here. Okay, and then we have the reason. The reason is now. Now look at this. This here. This is a pronoun. Okay, for this, this is essentially the content of of this part and this part for this is what is you can essentially put an equal sign here for this is the law and the prophets and so many uh commentators many and i agree with them they say that this is you, you could this is a merism that signal that's that signifies the ot So however else you want to understand Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, the conclusion is whatever you wish that others would do to you, command, do also to them. And then the reason is that this is the law and the prophets. So I, I want to come back to here because whatever else was said, whatever else was said last week, um, is this still an effect? Is this still, is this the, the completion? We, we, we can't get around this. Let's just take a pause. Any questions or comments? Why, why there is the law and the prophets? Why, why are the prophets included in the last sentence? Yeah, so, so the law and the prophets, this would be, this is called a merism. It's a figure of speech. Amerism, you would describe it would it's like it's like a polar opposites. And the point is that it's describing everything in between. So for example, God is called the Alpha and Omega. The Alpha and Omega is the beginning of the Greek alphabet. The Omega is the end of the Greek alphabet. And so in calling God the Alpha and Omega, it's signifying that He's the beginning, the last, and, and everything. He's eternal. Okay. So so the use of the word law and the prophets, that's why we're saying this signifies this equals OT, Koi Bo Boy. Old Testament, yeah. But if you're looking in a technical sense, we talked about this before, Koi Bo Boy. You had the law and then the prophets. Were, remember, we talked about the importance of the Mosaic period being even greater than the prophets. The prophets are just interpreting and applying the law, right? So the prophets are definitely dependent upon the law. But in this sense, I would say that it's signifying the Old Testament. And if this is, if, if, if this is the summary, if this is the summary of the Old Testament, that's essentially what is being said there. This is a summary. If this is a summary, that's very strong. We can, we, can, we can directly preach those eternal components, the weightier matters, the weightier matters without apology, without, um, without fear, with full authority. Uh, sir, could we, in context, sir, could, because I, I encounter or some uh, kind of commentary about Matthew, Mm. Uh, could we say that um, um, in this aspect, this context, in terms of the law, is uh, Matthew is kind of legalistic in terms of uh, uh, kind of um, promoting uh, having this law uh, to be followed? Are, so, is are you using legalistic in a negative? Co because the so the, the Pharisees were legalistic. It's very it's a pejorative term. Are you using it in a pejorative term, or are you using it in the sense of just? Uh, ethical morality. Yes, ethic, that's a term, ethical morality. 
Yeah. So <laughs> no, no. Yeah. So, so yeah. So what I would say is that this is what I would say. I would say that in Matthew, in different places, there is an emphasis upon, um, upon Jesus's sacrifice for sure. Um, and so that sacrifice implies imputed righteousness. So what I, so what I want to say here is that in Matthew, let's just, um, let me do a new, let me do a new slide here. In, in Matthew, there is, there is, so when you talk about legalistic, we, we could, we, we're, we're referring to righteousness, Bob, because righteousness is always pertaining to the to law. The law. Yeah. yeah. So what I would say is in, in, in Matthew, there is uh, imputed righteousness, imputed, and also number two, ethical. Yeah, correct, uh, correct, sir. Yeah, yeah. And so in some contexts, the, the imputed is being highlighted. In other places, the, impu uh, the ethical is being highlighted. And so we don't want to pit the two against as if, as if Matthew is only... As if Matthew is only focusing on ethic, ethical. Yeah. yeah. So no, it's both. And so we would say in the Sermon on the Mount, he's focusing on on eth on ethical. But remember, the imputed is implied. The, the, the imputed is in, in, is implied in in um in the Sermon on the Mount in in the idea of sonship. Do you see that? So whenever there's a reference to uh, your Heavenly Father. That's already that's already dealing with the right relationship that has been restored, and so that's why I kept coming back to the emphasis of it's it's already in a Christian believer context. It's it's um, Jesus is oftentimes speaking to, uh, so we can also talk about that these are already his disciples. Okay, so. When you see these being referenced now, of course, there are true believers and there's also unbelievers, but it's in that context of, it's not in, in um, now there are places in Matthew where there's for sure, there's gospel context, right? So we went back to the three, there's the, the preaching of, of the gospel of the kingdom, right? There's the teaching and there's the healing, remember? The, the threefold ministry of Jesus. This is Matthew. This is mentioned twice. It's highlighted in Matthew uh, 4.23 for sure. So you have to look at what context is it? Which one is it of those, of those three? And so we would say in, in Matthew 5 to 7, it's definitely teaching because the, he, he taught in, he sat down to teach in, in Matthew 5.1. And at the end, he taught not as the scribes, but actually having authority. So at looking at these three, we would say that the, the accent here, uh, Jesus, is on the ethical, uh, on the ethical teaching. But of course, that's not to say if someone was listening and they were not a believer, uh, that's where that's where Chalmer was highlighting, and I really appreciate that. If if yeah, if someone is not a believer and they're they're hearing the law, that should drive them to Christ. That should drive them to. To, to, to see the need to, 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 to repent. Um, and that, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yes, sir. It's very clear now. Yeah, yeah. I understand now. Yeah, it's because last uh, Monday is kind of uh, complicated. Some seems like uh, uh, it's more in the ethical or in the in the um, moral aspect that uh, we are uh, focusing, focusing much last yeah. Saturday. Yeah, and, and, and maybe that was part of my failure, Jesus, because we were answering the specific question of the relationship of, of Decalogue, of Mosaic law to the New Testament. So we were yeah. addressing a specific, yeah. So that was my mistake for not really setting the context. Uh, that was yeah. my, yeah, that was my deficiency there. So yeah. I, I do apologize. For that. That was yeah. Halfway through, I was like, okay, yeah, I need to set the context. Yeah, so good. All right, great. Thank you, sir. Thank you so no, no much. Problem. Thank no you problem. for clarifying no that. Okay. Yeah. I, I will add one more caveat here, or not caveat, but the same for Paul. Diba, if you go to Romans, Paul focuses on the uh, Paul is the opposite. So let me just let me just add really quick here for Paul. Let me just get another one. Um, in in Romans, it's different. Okay, in Romans, in Romans one, eighteen to three, 
uh, 19. This is the, the law driving to, uh, to Christ, okay? Then you have uh, 320 through 5, I think I'm, I'm messing up the passage, but I think it's 521, is dealing with the, the work of Christ. Um, and, and our response, which is faith, okay? And then 6, 1 to 8, 39, essentially, plus or minus, is, is Christian living. This is ethical. <laughs> you see that? Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's now, now there, is, there is a component there that makes sense that there is also the history of redemption there. So I don't want to um, overstate my case. But so what I'm trying to get at is here is this is, uh, this is imputed righteousness. And then this is um, uh, ethical, <laughs> ethical righteousness. And if you read, if you read, um, and then this really comes to bear in 12, 1 to 16, 27. Okay, this is really applied in the church, big time, um, ethical, ethical. Um, you know, here, this is dealing with Israel and gospel, relationship to the gospel. Um, uh, so, so what I want to say is that really in, in Paul's got in Paul in, in, in Romans, it's the same. He accents ethical at the end. And the first part is the imputed, the need for imputed righteousness. So it's, it's there in both. If I can give you a better outline for Romans, uh, I can, we need to do a, a book study in Romans. Um, but anyway, the just remember the gospel described and gospel applied in Romans. So great. Uh, any other questions or comments? So the, the saw here is like putting everything from chapter six, start from starting from chapter six all the way to verse 11 of chapter seven. And then he's like concluding it saying, so whatever you wish others, or this is just chapter seven, starting from judge not here in, in verse 12 of chapter seven. So is it in reference to the whole coming starting from chapter six all the way here to uh, is he like concluding what he has said like yeah so, so whatever this, you wish yeah so, so what what I, what I would say is let me um let me just bring this up here what I would say here is um I'll just do I'll just do here there are there are um like inclusios so if you look for those who don't know an, an inclusio is like a, a, a like the repetition of a word to signify there's a bracket a beginning and a close so you know um the beginning of the sermon of the mount begins with blessings i mean and that's that's really interesting because the end of the mosaic law is blessings or cursings and so there's there's so much interplay with what's with because jesus is bringing the mosaic law to completion okay so he begins with blessing, a blessing statements, okay, and a description of being salt and light in verses 13 to 15. But then here, if you look, um, I can't really zoom here, but if you look at verse 17, I've not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill them. And then again, he, the, um, until all is fulfilled in the law, until all is accomplished. So, so especially, I would say that's the first part of the inclusio. So that begins Paul's teaching on the law, 517. And then it concludes, it concludes in Matthew 7, 12. Mm. So whatever you wish others to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So it's like, yeah. Yeah. So th th that's very important then because it, starting chapter six. Uh, Jesus talks about this righteousness as well, yeah. which he said that we should not be like this uh, Pharisees. So then um, 
it is clear that yeah. when we are in Christ, um, not only that our righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees because we stand in the righteousness of Jesus, yeah. but at the same time, um, our righteousness is, is exceeds that of them because when you look at prayer, you look at giving, you look at fasting, uh, the Pharisees are all but, but a show, but yes. when, when we look at this teaching of Jesus, it calls us to a genuine giving, genuine fasting, genuine yeah. prayer. No, I think that's excellent what you're saying, Enting, and especially bringing out beware of practicing your righteousness, because again, you're right. This is in the context, this actually further strengthens the point that he's addressing the pharisaical uh, interpretation, because he goes from right interpretation of the law, right to practicing your righteousness, which what you're saying, this is the, this is the, the hypocrites in the synagogues. This is literally the Pharisees. Um, so you're absolutely right. And um um, yeah, I agree with you. I, 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 I agree with uh, this is ethical. Um, it's not the imputed is, uh, is, is presupposed, but it's not um, the ethics. The ethical is being highlighted here. Yeah, I will come down here. There's one other there's one other phrase that kind of also brings new meaning. So uh, in verse 15, there's the warning there of, of false prophets that are coming in sheep's clothing, but are ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. And then look at, look at um, verse 21. Everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but the one who does the will of my father. On, many, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not do many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. There's that word, the opposite of righteousness, you workers of lawlessness. So again, this, this beware of practicing your righteousness, um, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. The Pharisees are lawless ones from Matthew 23. I think what you're really bringing out and thing is this, um, you have this interchange throughout. Yeah. Would it be the righteousness that Jesus is referring to is the righteousness that he gives us uh, imputed to us when we uh, submit we trusted him as our lord and savior and something like that so it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of righteousness right yes yeah, so the one that's being exhibited by the pharisees so in this context it could be people who do who do these things could have done it while they may they may look as righteous in the eyes of man but it's it's just about being self-righteous in some way yeah 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 but so what are you saying I, I guess i'm confused so so what are you um i i mean what i'm trying to say is the the, the, the righteousness that, that jesus was referring to is the righteousness that he imputed to us when he trusted him as so in matthew that you have the imputed righteousness in other locations but here this would be ethical righteousness because we are called to live by by a standard and so here he will say to them i will declare to them i never knew you so this is not like they were in and then they were out it's that he never knew them right he never knew them so it was never a relationship that they lost so this is not an earning their salvation it's 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 saying he never had a relationship with you with them i never knew you depart from me and then it's you doers you workers of lawlessness and so um, this would not be addressing um, imputed righteousness. This would just be straight up describing the Pharisees. They are, in fact, their righteousness is nothing more than lawlessness because the whole point that we made last week was that the intent of the law was the internal and then just the external was the manifestation. So Enting brought up, this was the other thing I was going to bring out. And I didn't emphasize this, and I really appreciate when I went back and listened to the edit, I was like, wow, Enting really emphasized this. And so I do want to give him props. This heart condition, the promise of the heart condition in the prophets is huge. And when you when you come here, although Jesus is dealing with with um in many times external, he also is getting the heart issues. And so it, it's an issue of a heart, and, and you see that coming out here. I never knew you. 
There is no heart change. There is no heart relation. I think the confusion comes, sir, team, yeah. and and how if if you're not familiar with the context, which is uh, how to be in the kingdom, or if you are how to live in the kingdom um, of of God, which is Jesus talking to his disciples primarily, at least uh, with the presence of the crowd. Because of, of how verse 21 is worded, that everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my father, which um, many many of us who believe that it's only by faith, will protect what we believe by faith and say, it is not by doing the will of the father that brings you into the kingdom of God. But if you look at the context, that those who are really in the kingdom are put it in our own terms today, if those who are really put their faith in Jesus Christ uh, will begin to, to obey uh, the Father. Yeah. Yeah, no, so, so yeah, no, um, what you're saying, yeah, Tim, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it, uh, in, in some aspect, I think Jesus answered what the will of the Father was, right? And that is to, to make him his, to put his, to put your faith in him. So, so there was, there was a lot of, there was a lot of different things that the will of the father is calling us to do in Matthew. So there is, there is the need and requirement to put the faith in the son. You see that there's also the need to obey the law. There's also the need to care for the prophet. The one who gives the, the, the drink of water will no ways lose his reward. So there's a lot of different things in in Matthew's gospel that describes the will of the Father. The, the key is that you are doing the will of the Father. Yeah. Uh, this discussion on imputed righteousness and the righteousness of the Pharisee, is it uh, our understanding that when we say imputed righteousness, it is the kind of righteousness or is the type of righteousness that is given by Christ when we accept him and we make him our Lord and Savior that will give us the salvation? Yes. against the righteousness of the Pharisees that is only concerned about obeying the law. Is that the right context? Yeah, so that would be, that's part of the discussion. So it's more than that though, because so what, what, what people will often do, Cody Boy, is it, people put it in either or. It's only imputed yes. and it's only, it's only ethical, okay? So, so let me just draw a picture here so I hope everyone can see. I actually had, I don't know if I posted yet, we did, we did a, a thorough investigation on the relationship between faith and works in, J in James 2. I need to post the video. If I can do that, I'll, I'll share it. But this is the, this is the, this is the picture. Uh, internally, there must be uh, genuine faith. Okay. From the genuine faith comes uh, that genuine faith produces good works. Okay, we could also describe this as righteousness. So the picture is the picture is that this is the this is the the picture of the the Christian life, the Christian life, and then this is connected with the spirit. Okay, the Christian life. Okay, so so we can look at. We can look at genuine righteousness, and the, so a person can look at genuine righteousness, and the, and they wouldn't say, "Oh, he he is uh, he is earning his own salvation." They would recognize that there is genuine faith, and the Spirit is working behind the scenes. Okay, um, what what the the, the uh, what was going on here is that there was. This is in a, there was a, um, uh, this is the, the, the Pharisees. And they had a righteousness. They had a righteousness. Okay. It was external. There was nothing internal about it. So let's add one more thing. Genuine faith produces a genuine righteousness. Okay, so there's there's a genuine righteousness that is produced from the genuine faith. Okay, 
the Pharisees had a, a, a righteousness that was only external. And we saw in the pre last week, we saw that inside it was actually dead, right? They're empty tombs, right? They were, they were, they were bad, uh, uh, bad trees. Okay. There's a lot of different things to describe that. Okay. And so what, what Jesus is talking about is those people that have this. So genuine righteousness also could be described as doing the will of the father. So Jesus is highlighting, no one knows the person's heart. Only God knows the person's heart. But to the disciples, Jesus is emphasizing those that have genuine righteousness, oh. will, those that have genuine righteousness will enter the kingdom of God. But we, but we should not suppose that it's, that it's uh, earned. We, should, we can look back. So we can look back. This works both ways, Diba. So if we see someone with genuine righteousness, we should not say they're earning their salvation. We will say they have genuine faith, okay? And it's the genuine faith that's, that is this, we could call this also knowing. So Jesus called it knowing. We could talk, we could, we could talk about a transformed heart. These are just different ways to describe the same thing. We can talk about, um, and it's in this, it's in this knowing, this genuine faith. So in, in the faith is when you have the transaction, the transaction of, of Christ's righteousness to us. And our sin to him. Does everyone see that? So we get... We give him our sin, our sin debt, and he gives us his righteousness, okay? It's, but it's in, uh, this happens with saving faith, okay? So if Jesus is focusing on genuine righteousness, this doesn't necessarily come up. Does everyone see that? Because this is the, what comes from this, is genuine righteousness, i.e. loving your neighbor as yourself, loving God, loving neighbor. Is everyone tracking there with me? So Jesus is looking at this. Jesus is saying, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but the one who does the will of my father. So he's He's, he's accenting this, but in accenting that, it's presupposing this. But he doesn't have to necessarily talk about that because later, elsewhere, it's clear that only those that have saving faith will enter. So, so let's be clear here. So in, 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 in the Sermon on the Mount, this is being described as sonship. That's what I'm trying to get at. So where Jesus is accenting the the imputed righteousness or the that's in saving faith and sonship so when when we're when we refer to our heavenly father when we're praying so so let's go back to let's go back to here let's look let's look at the difference between genuine uh genuine sonship and 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 a false sonship so let's go to matthew matthew 6 so i need it but uh beware of practicing your righteousness righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them Okay, so look at the hypocrites. They, 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 um, they sound the trumpet in the synagogues that they may receive the praise of others. I say to you, they have their reward. Okay, but when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, the Pharisees. They love to stand. They pray externally. They receive their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father in secret. So it's a relationship. It's knowing. There's this knowing uh, you're, you're, you're speaking to your father. So the Pharisees, they don't have a relationship with the father. They're externally praying, but they're not internally praying in their room. Um, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. Okay. But when you pray like, pray like this, our father. So it's presupposing this imputed righteousness relationship, saving faith. All that's imputed in this idea of sonship, our father. Okay. 
Um, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So there's, there's the, 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 the presupposition of, of, of sacrifice, right? Forgiveness of sins, okay? But Jesus can highlight, Jesus can also highlight the external. A genuine saving faith produces genuine righteousness, genuinely loving God and genuinely loving his neighbor. So Jesus can say, those that have genuine righteousness they're going to enter my kingdom. He's not accenting the, the you know, it's, that's like saying, um, uh, yeah, that would be like describing an outward action of, I say like, there's a kid down the street and they say, she, the, the, the girl down the street, she's riding around on her green bike and her hair is bump, bopping up and down. Oh, she's going into my house. I don't have to say that's my daughter. Maybe I do say that, but it, but it's the characteristic of my daughter. And so I can point to the external or to the internal or to the birth certificate. There's different ways of identifying my daughter. And so here Jesus is accenting the external. And why do you think he would, why do you think he would uh, highlight the external? Anyone, why do you think he would highlight the external for us? It's a comparison with the parasitical external righteousness. Yeah, because we can't see the internal, Diva. No one can see the internal. <laughs> right, Diva? Look, look at this. Beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, right? You don't know the inwardly. You can't see inwardly their ravenous wolves. You shall recognize them by your fruits, their fruits. Can a grape... So this is the analogy here. Can grapes be gathered from thorn bushes, okay? If you see a thorn bush, you don't say, oh, it could be a grape. It could be a grape tree. There's a chance the root's actually a grape. Maybe one day it will grow a mango. You'd say, no, 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 no. If I see thorns on a tree, there's no way it's a mango tree. You, can, you, you would know the roots, the internal by the external. And that's what Jesus is highlighting. He's highlighting the external. So coming back to here, oops, coming back to here. Um, so we could talk about fruit. The fruit of the mango tree re 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 reveals the internal. So we can't see, no one can see the heart. Yeah. Is, is everyone tracking there with me on that? He clarified if where do, where do that imputed right useness actually come in because we are talking of uh, two kinds of righteousness that's why uh, unless you exceed the righteousness of the person that's why there are two now types of righteousness that is uh, mentioned in this case so since uh, we use the word imputed righteousness and you are using genuine righteousness are they one and the same thing no so what i want to say is yeah. So, so what I want to say is there's only one perfect righteousness that's credited to us. Okay. Even our righteousness is mingled with, with, it's not perfect. Only Christ is perfect. So really you'd have to talk about three righteousness. What, what I want to highlight here is that Jesus is contrasting the righteousness, the righteousness of the, of the Pharisees. And he's contrasting it with the genuine righteousness of his, of his sons. That's the contrast there. So that's why I'm saying, I, that's what I'm saying. Imputed righteousness is not in the purview. It, it has to be presupposed when he talks about sonship. Okay. But it's not in, it, it's not in the purview. Okay. Um, what's in the purview is, is all that we can see. Because again, there was a group saying, this is how you live. And Jesus is saying, no, this is really how we're all, we, we ought to live, okay? Um, maybe that's helpful. Maybe that's helpful uh, for us. Um, and Paul does the same thing. Paul does the same thing. Anyone uh, so else want to follow in, me? In there are three righteousness, per se. The genuine, which is the perfect coming from Christ, the shared righteousness imputed to us when we accepted Christ, and the third righteous of the Pharisee. 
Yeah, so what, yeah, so yeah, so let's just be clear. What I'd say is genuine righteousness produced by the spirit. So we could say the fruits of the spirit, or so so Dibasso in here, the saving faith, there's also the spirit is presupposed. So we could say genuine righteousness produced by the spirit or the fruits of the spirit. Okay, that those would be language. There's the imputed righteousness, which is absolutely perfect and flawless. So we stand before Christ, it's perfect. No one, even in the spirit. We are we do not exemplify perfect righteousness. Okay, um, uh, so most fundamental is the imputed righteousness. Yet, because of the giving of the Spirit, we can exemplify the fruits of the Spirit um, because of of imputed righteousness that is at the foundation. Okay, and then there is a an external righteousness that, in fact, is is lawlessness. It's not real. It's 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 a facade. It's outwardly a white tomb. Inwardly, it's it's a tomb. It's it's a white painted sepulcher. Uh, I I actually clarify that because my understanding of imputed is it's like it's part of a thing. Like when you buy a car, included is the sum of the accessories, but not all accessories are found in the car. So when you say you are a son, it is imputed that you are a future heir. That is what I understand by imputed. So. If we if you use that in the in the righteousness because we are not righteous, so that my uh, understanding is we become the son because of our sonship, the imputed righteousness is that comes up that comes in with the sonship that we become righteous in his sight because we are now it is now imputed being his son. Yeah. That is how uh, that is my understanding of the imputed righteousness. That's why I clarified if that is the context of imputed righteousness vis-a-vis -vis the other righteousness that we are explaining to differentiate yeah. the righteousness yeah. of the Pharisees. Yeah, no, that's no, that's really good. Yeah, so we want to talk about the imputed, what you just described. Yeah, and then and then there is really the genuine that's produced. It's still flawed. It's not perfect, right? Um, but it's 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 following the pattern of Christ. And then there's the righteousness of the Pharisees, which is unequivocally lawlessness. We would not want to say it's a good form of righteousness in any way acceptable in God's sight. It's it's a different kind. So it's like the thorn bush and the mango tree. <laughs> it's the thorn bush and the mango tree. It's a different kind. It's a different seed. It has. It, there's no relationship there. Great, excellent. So Tim, uh, yeah. would it be fair to say that anyone who tries to earn uh, righteousness on his own is would fall under the righteousness of the Pharisees. Absolutely, absolutely, because because internally they're 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 doing it independently of their own will, right? It's going back to the garden of us trying to live on our own. We're trying to gain acceptance by God apart from Him. The whole point of creation and and Adam's relationship with God was one of dependence. And then when they chose their own way, um, they're trying to get themselves back in by this uh, uh, self-autonomy. And it'll never, the internal will never be there. And so you're right. Any form of, of attempt to gain a right relationship with God of our own power is lawlessness. Because internally, we're corrupt. We cannot change our heart. It has to be changed by God. Excellent. Okay, anyone else want to add, or is that good so far? Okay, let's move on here, because I do want to get to the last part of our, of our study. Um, so let me just try to uh, move on here. So uh, the, the, the other statement, so the other statement that, again, is a summary. So we have two statements in, in Matthew's gospel. First was uh, Matthew 7, 12, and then here, Matthew 22, 37 to, to, to 40, you have the, the first command. And you have the second command. And again, I want to bring this out. On these two commandments depend all, again, the law and the prophets. So people, people talk about Jesus having a different law. And it's, no, we summarize the law. And the law is love God and love others. It's still, it's still, it, those are the eternal truths. They never change. 
The specific context has changed. We're not under the Mosaic Covenant as a system. We're now under the New Covenant, but the summary does not. And so again, here you have on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So again, this is a reference to OT. And so we can, when we go to the great Shema in Deuteronomy 6, 4, hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then it says, and you shall uh, teach this to your, your children um, when you're walking in the way, when you're sitting, when you're lying down, when you're rising up, write it on your doorposts. We can directly teach that to our children. And that is the basis for us to teach. That doesn't change. We can directly command this. And, and you can, I think we're seeing the, 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 the fruit of this with many people are afraid to directly preach commands. They only want to preach fulfillment or they only want to preach relationship to Christ in the Old Testament. They don't want to directly preach commands from the Old Testament. All of the weightier uh, internal, the internal weightier matters of the law, we can directly preach. We can directly preach to all of our members without fear. And you see that in the Psalms, right? The Psalms, it's, it's, it's all eternal truths. The, 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 the Psalms, the prayers, the, the, um, a lot of the wisdom, they're, they're dealing with eternal truths. Um, we can directly preach. I hope that's a big takeaway from this, this study, that we can preach directly. We should preach. We must preach directly. They have not been done away with. The, the external application might change, but the internal truth does not. So this is just review. Matthew 5, 17, 20 describes Jesus fulfilling it both in his obedient life and giving its true meaning as commandments to be taught and obeyed. So those are the three the three com components there. Uh, Matthew 5, 21 to 28 does not deal with changing the law, but interpreting it, giving it its true meaning. And so those other passages just really highlight what, what Jesus is doing there. Um, and there it is. The meaning is found in Matthew 7, 12, Matthew 22, 34 to 40 in the Great Commission. So teaching those disciples that you make, you baptize them in the Trinitarian uh, name, and then you teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And how can you summarize that command? <laughs> love God and love others. So the rest of Jesus is teaching their specific context. But we could summarize that teaching in love God and love others. And so in the Great Commission, we have to be doing this. Um, does Jesus fulfill it? Absolutely. Are we still bound to obey and keep it? Absolutely. It is still binding for all disciples for Christ in all nations for all time. So all disciples of Christ in all nations for all time. This fundamental command, love God, love others. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's describing our relationship to others. So that, that never changed for all time. From all time, from Genesis, from Genesis pre-redemption, we are to do to others as we would want them to do to us. And we would love God. It's never changed. Okay, so uh, just reviewing uh, Romans uh, 2, 12 to 16. What I'll do is I'll share this PowerPoint for everyone. So you can, you can see this. I'll share this PowerPoint for everyone. Uh, Romans 2, 12 to 16 and Luke 18, 18 to 30. Uh, this is primary context for teaching us to use the law to expose sin in people. So this is another point as to why we can't say the law is abrogated in its eternal sense. Because we still, if the law is no longer binding, then we can't hold other people accountable for breaking it. Um, do, you see, do you see what I'm saying? So Jesus uses, Romans 2, Jesus uses the law, the Decalogue, the fundamental eternal parts to expose people's sin. We can still teach. We can still bring people to Christ. So there is a fundamental part of drawing people to Christ um, that we can use the law for. Um, Romans 13, 8 to 10, Ephesians 6, 1 to 3, and James 2, 8 to 13. 
It teaches us that the law is to be used in the church as a rule for Christians to follow. So not the physical, external, the, the ceremonial law that has been fulfilled in Christ, not the, uh, um, those, those applicated applications direct, but the, the way to your internal troops, we can, we can directly apply it. It's to be used in our life for Christians to follow in the, in the context of the church, those weightier matters. Okay, we are the last part of tonight. We're going to look at Ephesians 2, 11 to 22 to look at one other relationship of how we see this. So let's take, let's just take a 10 minute break. And then when we come back, we're going to look at uh, Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. If you want. Yeah, so, so through, throughout Jesus's teaching, there, there is hyperbole. So from hermeneutics, Diba, in hermeneutics, hyperbole is a figure of speech. Okay, so that's not to say that we should not debas. So the command here is the command is it's 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 looking at this this command to not commit adultery, right? Okay. So then from here, there is this um we, we would say is this literal or is this a figure of speech? Right. So um from hermeneutic from hermeneutics class, people have taken it literally. I think in church history, some people have like ripped their eye out. Okay, but but I but I do think that that the focus here is that Jesus is emphasizing how important it is for the lustful intent, so that what he's trying to say is there's no sacrifice too great to make in order that you would not go to hell. Right. So. You could take it literally, but I do think that this statement could be taken as a figure of speech using using hyperbole, like you said. So I don't I don't think that we. Um, um, so, for example, the other example of figure of speech is merism, right? So we, we talked about the merism that Jesus uses, which is re referencing law and prophets, right? Jesus is Jesus is clearly using. Um, figures of speech in his teaching, um, right? So even like like a beatitude is a figure of, is a type of 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 a literary device, right? The beatitude. Does that answer your question, or what, yeah, uh, what, what, yeah, what, what are you trying up, to get to? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. My 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 follow up is if if we are to. Uh, should I say, if we are to interpret uh, a kind of statement, because this is one whole, what, what, what I'm thinking in this context, this is a one whole sermon. And yeah, in every topic, uh, should we say that in every topic, there's a, a we will interpret this as a, a figure of speech and this, the other one is literal, or should there be a uniform interpretation of each uh, passage? Sorts. Well, so like when I'm just speaking, Diba, I, I can just use a figure of speech to emphasize my point, right? So I'm I'm having a discourse with you, commanding, maybe I'm commanding, maybe I'm commanding you to do something. You're an employee for me. And I say, I say, um, uh, you know, you guys have not been working and I've caught you several times. I'm going to go down to the to the to the hardware store, and anyone I find sleeping, I'm, I'm going to fire them on the spot. Right? That could be literal, or I could be emphasizing the fact that you better be working the whole time. I mean, we use figures of speech as we speak, so um, there's a difference between looking at looking at um, the the genre. And, and then specific figures of speech in the genre. So this is a sermon. So that's the genre, Diba. Now, coming back to the, coming back to the, um, the Lutheran interpretation, Chalmer, to, to, to put it in, in better context, the Lutheran interpretation, that's actually a hermeneutical uh, framework. So what the Lutherans will say is you are to apply whatever you see law the, the purpose, this is not in the context, this is like your hermeneutical lens. Whenever I see law, 
I'm to, I assume I cannot do the law and it's to drive me to Christ. So that's a, that's a, a template that they're putting on here, right? Because there's nowhere in the context that Jesus comes around and says, see, no one can do this, turn, tur turn to Christ. That's different than the gospel of Romans, where he, in Romans, there's clear failure of the Gentiles, of the Jews in, in Romans 2, Romans 3, everyone stands guilty. Christ is the only way. Like, like the narrator is very explicit in, in highlighting the driving to Christ. In, in, the, in, the, in Luke 18, right, in Luke 18, that would be also a context that clearly implies, um, so let's go to Luke 18, right? So Luke 18. So here, the, the question is inheriting eternal life, right? And so he says, no one is good except God alone, right? So I would say this, in this context, it's clear that this is a gospel context. Jesus is not just teaching on interpretation of the law. This is a gospel. If you're looking at Jesus as deep, the teaching, God, uh, preaching the gospel, or so this would be rep calling to repentance or healing, I would say that clearly the, the, these are clues that it's a gospel context. He goes through the law, right? One, two, three. And the guy says, all these I've kept from my, my youth. He's directly, <laughs> this is like a direct contradiction, right? So there's, it's very, this context is very clear that Jesus is using the law to drive him to Christ. So then he says, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. You have treasure in heaven, come follow me. Okay. Um, uh, so that Jesus makes a statement how difficult it is for those to have who have wealth. And then who then can be said can be saved? Uh, without what what is impossible with God is what is impossible with uh, what is impossible with man is possible with God. That's the conclusion. Okay. So the context is driving us to that right interpretation, right, Chalmer? Comparing to, to comparing to Matthew. Look at how the ending ends. The ending ends, there's, the, there's this call to, 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 do, to, to, to do this. There's, there's a warning of, um, there's a call. So this is a command. There's also, there's also a command here, right? Then there's a, 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 there's a warning. And then, Look here. Um, everyone who hears the words of mine and does them is like a man who built a house upon the rock. Everyone who who hears my words and does not do them will be like a foolish a foolish man, and it leads to this fall. Okay. And when they finished these sayings, the crowd was astonished by his teaching. So to me, it doesn't seem there's nothing in the context that would say, "See, Christ is saying this is impossible. Turn to him." Do you, see, do you see I'm saying there's nothing there? And especially coming back up to here, you have the reference to you have the reference to this um, bearing um, uh, uh, this external looking at the fruit externally. And so I would say there's a lot of clues in here that that tell us which way to go it, it, for direct application, for, for direct meaning, what's the primary purpose? Are you tracking there with me, Chalmer? Is that making sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Pastor Jim. Yeah. It, it's really important that we, that again, I'm not saying that, Chalmer, I'm not saying that we don't use Matthew in, in driving to Christ context. If I was working with someone who's an unbeliever, I would take them to Matthew. Like, this is what Jesus commands us. And someone who's an unbeliever, um, maybe he'll maybe maybe he'll outwardly tell you he's doing those things, but inwardly he's struggling with that because he knows he doesn't. Okay, so again, I'm not saying that we can't use it in a secondary application for driving to Christ, but for the purpose here, it just I I think if you look at the broad enough context, you will you will the, the because remember Jesus Jesus teaches the context, but the but the the writer is going to give you the clues. He's going to give you the clues on what he wants you to know. And so um, 
I think that you just have to keep looking at the broader context to really see where the author is, is, is driving us. I do think, again, that this is the righteousness of the, like he's, both Jesus and Matthew is telling you that the, unless your righteousness exceeds the, unless your righteousness exceeds lawlessness, <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like it, 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 it's not even close. It's not like the, 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 so Chalmer, just to get specific here in a Lutheran reading, what, what the, the Lutherans are say is that the right, the Pharisees had the best righteousness. And if they can't get in, no one can get in. You have to turn to Christ. But that's not what Jesus is saying. The Pharisees don't have the best righteousness. They appear to be righteous, but their righteousness, it's the worst kind of right. It's lawlessness. So I think that's the direction that, that, that Jesus and the gospel author is pointing us to, that Jesus' disciples have this different kind of genuine righteousness, genuine fruit, ethical fruit. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that I think that the context will always tell us how to take it. I, I think. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcised uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made by the flesh of by hands. Remember that you are at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, who uh, once were afar off, you who were once were afar off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both of us one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. He came and preached, peace to you who are afar off and peace to you who are near. For through him we have access in one spirit to the Father, so that you are no longer strangers or aliens, but fellow citizens and saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. It was just like, wow. <laughs> so, I, I can't say everything here. I'm just going to talk through here. You can interrupt me to ask a question. I'm just going to highlight because, again, we're coming back to relationship. And we do have, If I, maybe you picked up on it. I, I said that we should not talk about the law and the new covenant as being one of abolishment with Christ. Um, here we have this word, abolishing the law of commandments. So <laughs> I want to address that. <laughs> At, at, at appearance, it might seem like, Tim, you just, you were, you, you did not preach the text, you were wrong. And so I, I do want to address this um, to help us also to, to give us hermeneutic, uh, hermeneutic guidance. Um, and I think the, the, the discussion with Chalmer on the break is really important because a lot of everything is in context. And so we really have to be so careful that we interpret, we look at the broader context, and then we orient we orient ourselves um, properly. I, I do want to say here that the primary topic is, is not, so the primary topic here, just to, to set the context, the primary topic here is that's very important. So the primary topic is the relationship between Jews and Gentiles, not OT law and NT law. Uh, otherwise, we have a conflict with what Jesus says, okay? So, but, but this is a, I believe, an accurate assessment, and this will help us in looking at uh, the use of the word abolishing. Um, if we understand that we're looking at 
relationship between Jews and Gentiles, uh, not the relationship between the Old Testament law and New Testament law, okay? So uh, just talking through here, uh, remember, so this is a command to be reminded that at one time, so if we're looking at a, uh, uh, this is a time, this is a, um, I shouldn't say this, let's, let's fix this here. This is a content reference. We are all Gentiles, and Paul is commanding them, the, the Ephesian believers. Dibasso, so uh, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, this is like salvation, Diba. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, you are his workmanship. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus uh, to do good works, which he had ordained beforehand. Okay. And so it's, it's then in this, therefore, that we're commanded to remember who we were. Okay. So we were at one time Gentiles in the flesh. Uh, we were the description of us. We are called. So our description was we were uncircumcised. So this is like we are we are in, uh, we are inferior. But look at this. Look at this here. Uh, the description of the circumcised, the circumcision, though, is this. This is external. I, I hope that you start to pick up on so many references to Paul. The unbelieving Jews, they were so focused on the external, when in reality, there's this internal, okay? So number one thing there to remember, the first thing is that they were at one time Gentiles according to the flesh. The second thing there to remember is what? They were separated from Christ. Whenever you see this word Christ, Always be thinking Jewish Messiah. Promise of Abraham and David. Okay? Always be thinking that. When you see Christ... You have to look at it in the context of the Jewish Messiah and the promise of, of Abraham and David. Any comments or questions on that? Everyone's tracking there with me? You were separated from Christ. So to be separated, you're outside of salvation, okay? So separated from Christ means outside salvation, Biba. You would think this, this, this implies uh, outside salvation, which it does, which it does. But this is a history of salvation, Diba, history of salvation reference. Okay, look at this. So let's get specific. Look at this. So what is, what is being separated mean? Being separated means you are alienated, right? An alien is a, a foreign alien is you are, you are not a citizen, right? You're not alienated. You are, you are a foreigner, okay? You are alienated, though. Look at this. From the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise. So this is not a different plan. It's not simply a type. I hope everyone sees that. The, the, the promises find their yes in Christ, who is the Jewish Messiah. This is one story. This is one story that uh, in Christ and his church, we are connected with Israel and Abraham. There is a, 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 there is a concrete connection there maybe you never saw that before and look at this so if you're separated from the common wealth of israel and strangers of the covenants of promise is that just external temporal temporal having no hope having no hope 
without God in the world. We have to see eternal and temporal parts to this. Everyone tracking there with me? Everyone tracking there with me? But now, so that's, that is, remember that, but now. In, in Christ Jesus, so this is a sphere. So you want to talk about imputed righteousness, Manga Kapati? This is union with Christ. We are in Christ Jesus. So union with Christ. There is your imputed righteousness. Every, all, everything else is given to us by way of our marriage to Christ. Okay? Uh, look at this. But now, in Christ Jesus, you. You. Notice here. You, <laughs> look at this, description. This is the description here. You were once afar off. So this is restatement. You were once afar off. Look at this. You cannot do this to yourself. This was not done by you. Look at the action. Brought near. Brought near. Brought near by the blood. So this is the instrument. Brought near by the blood of Jesus. Who's the actor here? Who's the actor here? The object is you. The means is the blood of Christ. Who's the actor? God. God. Come on. So we could say this actively. God has brought you near through the blood of Christ. This is why so fundamental, okay? But look at this, brought near to what? <laughs> brought near to what? You were far off. You are brought near uh, to God, to hope, to Israel, to the covenants of promise. Did you see this? In coming near to God, you are now, once you were separated from the commonwealth of Israel, once you were strangers, now you've been brought near. Okay? So, um, that's not to say we're going back to the old way. It is to say that, it is to say that we're, we're being brought into the plan of Israel. It's not a new plan. It's not a different plan. We're, 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 we're finding fulfillment. But it's, it's highlighting, again, coming back here, we're highlighting... It's from a, this is from a Gentile perspective. Everyone sees that? This is coming from a Gentile perspective. This is a different perspective than a Jewish perspective. This is a different perspective than, than, uh, than uh, looking at the law from Christ's perspective, right? So Christ was the speaker in Matthew 5, okay? For he, reason. So this here is a, this is going to be an explanation. For he himself is, uh, who is he? He is our peace. He is our peace. Who has made us both one. So let me ask the question. So this is the. This is the work of Christ. So this is the description of Christ's work. Let's ask the question of who is. So I'm just going to work here. This is, of course, this is Christ. So he is the actor. He has made us. Who is the us? Explicitly, someone get, tell me who the us is explicitly. Uh, 
uh, former who have no relationship with Christ. Gentile? Gentile. Yeah. Gentile. But, but there's someone else, right? So both one. So who, who else? Pastor Henry is partially right. It's the Gentile. And, and one, both one. That is with God or with Christ, both one. There's one other, there's one other. So Bibak, Christ is making two people one. Who is the other one? Israel. The Jew and the Jew. Yeah, the Jew. Do you see that? So he's bringing us together. Okay, he's bringing us together. So this is not a different plan. We can also speak of fulfillment, but it's coming from the Gentile perspective. So if we're looking, I'm highlighting the Gentile perspective. He has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Now, we would be tempted to say, see, um, and, then, and then look here, the means, the means specifically is abolishing the laws of commandments, okay? So we would be tempted to say abrogation abrogation no more laws no more law right that's what we would be tempted to say but that's a bad interpretation why is that a bad interpretation someone answered someone answered to me why that would be a bad interpretation the reason why we could not we could not look at we could not look at the law as being abrogated in the ultimate sense is because number one it conflicts with Jesus and number two perspective and I'm going to explain how even in the context of Ephesians it conflicts also with the the context okay let's look here Um, it's coming from this Gentile perspective. So do you see how from a Gentile perspective, they would say, okay, so let's look at, let's look, let's compare a, let's compare a Jewish perspective and a Gentile perspective, okay? In a Jewish perspective, the law is being fulfilled in Christ and new covenant, correct? So this is this is one of this is one of fulfillment. Everyone sees that. So the Jews are in the Old Testament. There's Israel. They're there, and then now they're being it's being fulfilled in Christ. Okay, so it's it's this anticipatory, right? From a Gentile perspective, looking at time, from a Gentile perspective, how would you describe a Gentile? Uh, can anyone try to describe for me a Gentile perspective pre-cross? How would you look at a Gentile perspective of, of what we've just described in this context? What's the Gentile perspective here in this context? Is it not alienation? Uh, being far off, uh, having a having a uh, wall of hostility. So, the Gentile perspective is not one of promise fulfillment. It's one of uh, Gentile is here. The Jew is here. And there is this big wall. So then, so then you have cross. And what happens? The Gentile is brought near to the Jew. And the wall is broken down. Do you see how that's a different perspective? 
So from a, from a Gentile perspective, 100% true. G, from a Gentile perspective, from, 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 from the Gentiles in Ephesus, 100%, Jesus has abolished the law so that he's broken this wall down so that they can be close. <clears throat> Everyone tracking there with me through the cross. But that's not an ultimate description of the relationship from law to, to, to Christ. It's in context. Let's, let, let, me, let me pause. Is everyone tracking there with me? I, I want to pause to make sure everyone's on the same page and I haven't lost anyone. Ask a question. Is this making sense? When you, when you ask, this is the perspective of a Gentile prick. Is it from the point of view of a Gentile? Is it yes. from the point of view of us looking at the Gentile? It's the point of view of the Gentile. It's the it's literally the point of view. Well, I mean, it's not even us. We are Gentiles. Dibasa, it's our perspective. <laughs> right? It's our perspective. Here's, here's the key. Here's the key. Uh, the key is the law and the commandments expressed in ordinances. This is not concerning the Decalogue. This is not abolishing God's law, eternal law. This is de dealing with the, the boundary markers. I don't know how to spell that, boundary markers. And uh, Tim, uh, go ahead, yeah. Uh, Tim, the way I understand it from what you've said, this is something to do with, I'm Jewish, uh, Jews, they have this kind of superior uh, mentality of being. Yeah. Then they have the Gentile thing. So Christ, in some way, with what he's referring to is that kind of mentality that both of these people have. They abolished that. Is that the one you're referring to? Yeah. No. Because they're, not, they're, yeah. Not yeah. Allowed, they're not allowed to intermarry with other yeah. With Gentiles, so yeah. those are some of the that they take. So, would that and, and, refer yeah. to that? No, because look here, look even here. There is this superiority uh, uh, feeling because you're you're absolutely right, uh, Ray. Because the the Jews, the what was the blessing of Abraham from biblical theology? The blessing of Abraham was all the nations would be blessed. There there should have never been an us versus them. The the Jews were just the means by which God would bless the world, and the Jews had totally lost sight of that. And so, and so there is this perspective, and that's what Paul is describing here, but it's not an ultimate. It's not an ultimate. So, so here, we could use the, aber the abolishing in this sense. Otherwise, we're directly conflicting with what Jesus said, right? I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. I, what I'm trying to do, Manga Kapitan, is I'm trying to synthesize how in this context, because some people will talk about abolish, some people will talk about nullifying, and I, what I want to say is we, we can't look at this, the, the, the ultimate picture is Christ fulfilling, that's the, that's the real, that's the real reality, this is in a, this is a perspective, an appearance, like what, like what uh, Kuya Ray is saying, the Gentiles had this view, how they were treated with the with with the um, uh, with the, with the Jews. So this is we could say here perhaps an outsider. This is also an outsider view. Outsider sir, view. Go ahead, uh, sir. Um, is that correct also to say that uh, in in the context of the unbeliever or shall we say in the, in the for the Gentiles, uh, the law is not needed or the law is been abolished. Is that correct to say that? No. not not from not uh the law as expressed in ordinances <laughs> so it's not it's not the the moral law it's not the eternal internal components uh jesus it's 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 these external boundary markers yeah okay yeah so what we could say here coming back here we're looking at the history of salvation here the history of salvation what has happened in the history of salvation and uh, specifically from the gentile perspective uh, go ahead okay i think this uh 
um, this verse 15 by abolishing the law of uh, the law of commandments expressing ordinance i think this refers to that about the okay if a gentile want to be part of to be a jew he has to observe the ceremonial circumcision physical yeah. circumcision yeah. to be so this is the law not the old testament law that that divides the jew and the gentile so, yeah, so remove this ordinance in Christ. This ordinance that Gentile and Jew they are all one because of Christ who has uh, because of the blood of Christ. So it's not yeah. the ordinance. It's yeah. not the Old Testament law. Yes, it's so we would want to say it's the external parts that 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 cause the separation, and that's what we want to say. So circumcision, the feast. Um the 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 cleansing all of those things that's what what, what separated but the eternal was always there and we're going to see that the eternal was always there okay it's never been removed yeah yeah good excellent you're tracking someone else want to add so 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 that's why sir so so uh the gentile are not bound to follow the law the external what i say yeah yes exactly exactly the we want to qualify the external law or we 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 could say the the mosaic covenant as a system. Sure. Yeah, we, they are we, not we, bound yes. to follow that. Okay. Yeah. So that's yeah. Clarified. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We have to really make a clarification there because what people will say is, see, all of the law is abolished, and we we again from Matthew. If we say that, then we're co directly conflicting with our work in Matthew. We're we're conflicting with even in Ephesians. You're going to see in Ephesians how that can't be the case. So what I, what we have to be what I'm trying to get at is we have to be so careful in our interpretation um and you're seeing it play out here yeah excellent someone else want to make a comment it i, I think it is really in connection goes uh, in connection to what the book of Ephesians, which is ecclesiology and and the yeah. main question is how can god have a people composed of jews and gentiles which chapter three and verse six talks about uh, that's a mystery before it's a mystery before so in other words what what we are dealing here is is how the lord has has brought together a people for himself no and that is yeah kept the people is again the ordinances that jesus took it. no that is an excellent point so that's coming back to yes no so it's this it's it's this uh this gentile jew excellent point ending i really agree with that that that's a really good point uh how can they coexist right how can they coexist excellent ending great really good go ahead just uh to relate to in things view that they cannot coexist because the Israelites think of themselves as separate from God. So that means if you are a Jew, you are a child of God. If you are not yeah. a Jew, then you are not a child of God. So there yes. is no way that they can be together in, yes. their, in, their, in their mind. Yes. That's the problem. Excellent. That is a phenomenal point. That is what both of you are saying. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's the issue. How can Gentiles be children of God? Yeah, absolutely. We're there. We're there. We're there. So look at this. Uh, so that this will be easy. Let's just finish this up here. We're almost done for the evening. So um, the purpose is that he's he's abolished this so that he will create in himself. Uh, he might create in himself the new man in place of two, making peace, and he might reconcile us to God in one body through the cross through the cross. So in Christ, he brings Jew and Gentile back together in Christ. That's, that is phenomenal. And this comes back to the promise of Abraham. I want to really stress that. In your offspring, all the nations, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He came and he preached peace. P 
Peace to you who are far off and peace to you who are near. Through him, we both have access to one spirit, uh, in one spirit to the Father. So the access is going through the spirit to the Father. So then look here, you are no longer, you the Gentiles are no longer strangers or aliens, you are, look at this, this is literally a uh, co, co-citizens, co-citizens with the saints, members of the household of God. So what Koyo Bobo is saying dead on, um, you, that is the Gentiles, are co-citizens. Now there's debate here, but look how they're built. Look at how they're built here. Um, debate here, a lot of debate. Apostles and prophets, um, is this, uh, NT or OT prophets. This is for sure NT. And and uh, um, Christ is the uh, Christ is the is the cornerstone. So look at this. Look at this here. Look at this. If this was the goal, if this was the goal, look at what it looks like here. The whole structure being joined together. This is where we're going to. This is the end of biblical theology one. It grows into a holy temple in the Lord. What did we describe garden? What did we describe the, the temple, the tabernacle as? From your reading, from our previous discussion, what is this? What is the temple? place where his people can meet him yes excellent so this is a uh a, a place of meeting with god so let's let's what else so let's let's add to this it's a place of meeting with god uh what else can we say from biblical theology what is it what else the garden was not a garden of man it was the garden of house house of god House of God. Oh, God. So, so, so uh, let's be explicit here. Dwelling place of God. <laughs> so it's, so look at this. Let's, let's draw this picture. Okay. So, I mean, this debate on cornerstone or capstone, but let's just say this, let's say Christ is the is the foundation it's built on the apostles and the prophets and it's growing up into a house jew and gentile right this is this is one uh one building right That's the imagery, and it's just it's just growing. It's growing, it's growing up, right? Everyone sees that. In him, you are also uh, being built together. <laughs> So temple and dwelling, look at this, temple and dwelling. It's almost the same thing. It's a restatement. So this is almost the same statement, right? And this is this. So, so let me ask a question for us, okay? Um, going to frameworks, um, going to plans of God, there seems to be one plan of God. I, I'm going to really push here. Uh, you know, some people are uh, dispensationalists, and they'll say that um, 
we're in the millennial kingdom, God's going to build his temple again. There's going to be sacrifices. From our biblical theological framework and this truth, you've got to build that wall of hostility back up. <laughs> That's a hard, I mean, this is a fundamental shift. This is, this is the cross has broken down the hostility between Jew and Gentile. We're one body. We're, we're, we're the new man. It just, it's impossible to say, by the way, when Jesus returns, he's going to build that wall back up. He's going to build the physical temple and we're going to have the physical sacrifices. It's all, do you see how this is going to a higher, this is going, this is transcending. This is transcending the physical. This is a spiritual building. Yeah, to, to, to bring in the idea that, that God would once again go back to the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, it's, it's just regressing. Instead of going yeah. to the plant, it's like regressing, going back again. Um, yeah, it's, it's going against uh, the progressive nature. Of yeah. So in closing here, I hope that we see, go ahead, yeah, someone, someone speak. Go ahead. Uh, Tim, this is uh, the perspective of Christians from, from, what, from what we're seeing it here. Okay. But the way the Jews understand it, it's a different thing. They still don't, they still, they still don't agree with this. That's why they're planning, planning to build another temple for that. Yeah, so I'm not talking about the, whether or not they actually build a temple this side. I'm saying there is a position that when Christ returns, he's going to build a temple in the millennial kingdom. It's going to be for the Jews. They're going to have sacrifices. They're going to, all the promises in the Old Testament will be fulfilled literally through literal sacrifices in the temple, um, all the different feasts. Um, and so, um, uh, it's from that perspective that I'm, I'm, I'm asking us to consider that compared to this, Ray. Okay. I see the, the way I understand it, the Jews right now are planning to build the temple so that by the time that the, the Messiah comes, he will be there to make the sacrifice. So I don't think Christians would go for that kind of um, plan or idea I, I don't think christ will go for it either <laughs> <laughs> we are now co-citizens jew and gentile look at this uh uh let's highlight some things here we're going to close on this uh let's change this to um green in himself a new man one body, one spirit, both have access, fellow citizens. We are joined together, being built together. So the, the, end, the end game will be in Revelation. 21 when 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 god the father dwells with us and so that will be biblical theology too so <laughs> that'll be biblical theology too we'll end it here um i really hope that the benefit here and why i wanted to close on this is i hope that we can see if i had just presented this to you without a biblical theological framework you probably would have said tim you're so wrong tim what are you doing I disagree with your interpretation. Having sat through the semester and seen the progressive nature of Revelation, seen the, the internal and the, and the eternal parts and the direction of progress of Revelation, coming here and making this conclusion, it's just like, it makes sense. It, it just, for me anyway, it brings whole new meaning to this passage, whereas this passage didn't make a lot of sense before when I was studying in seminary, it's just so powerful now. And, and the fact that Christ has brought Jew and Gentile together 
um, we would typically just look at it from like our Christian perspective and say like, okay, who cares? But like when you look at it from a historical, biblical, theological framework, it's so incredible. It's so incredible that this is what Christ has done. In Christ, he has brought, he is reconciling us all to God. And um, this is so much better than, than the garden. This will be so much better than the garden. So biblical theology two, we're going to teach in the fall. So I'm committing to it, to it now. We will teach part two, whether or not, I don't think we'll offer it through CGST because they just have one elective, but we'll offer it through EBST so you can join. And um, any comments or questions, any, anyone want to so in the Old Testament, the blessings of Abraham was to his descendant, the Jew, running towards to, to Abraham, to down to Noah, to Moses, everything done until the New Testament, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ completed uh, the blessings through his blood. So the Jew and the Gentiles are one in him. Yeah. Because remember, the Abrahamic, uh, the Abrahamic promise was the, the, was the solution to the Adamic fall. And in the Adamic fall, it brought the Ba from, from Genesis 4 and on. There's massive fighting between all people, you know, and then all through there's 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 gentiles and jews and all these different things and then in the new testament one of the perspectives is that christ is that solution that he undo does the curse in the cross he reconciles he creates the new man so look at the new man is even going back to the so uh let me just share this one thing here so what what what, what henry was sharing right this is a reference to adam <laughs> The new man, right? The new creation, new creation. There's so many more things we could add to this. I mean, there's there's so many. I mean, this is just um, so much, so much, um, so much, so much more we could talk about. Um, I just wanted to wet your whistle. I wanted to wet. I wanted to give you. I wanted to give you a taste. A in taste in present it. day, present day, huh? the present day. For the Israelites and the Filipino, we don't have problem. And for the Israelites and the Palestine, a Palestinian, they have problem. It could be. But, but Henry, Cigarado, in the church, Christian Jews and Christian, Christian Filipinos, no problem. In the church. It's in the church. So the Christian Jew, the, the, the Jews that are now Christian, we're, we're all being reconciled. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Because even among the Jews, they don't accept Jewish Christians. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They persecute them. Yeah. There, there's so much focus on the Jews, and that's right, because they were the focus. But long before Abraham came, the promise was, if you go back to Genesis 3.15, it was not really just for the Jews. It was uh, for men in general. And it was just funneled to the Jews yeah. because the Jews would be used and particularly Jesus. Yeah. But then long before Abraham, the promise has always been um, uh, for, for the godly line. The, yes. That does not mean Jews. That is phenomenal. And I want to stress what anything just said. So in describing that reconciliation, the, the, the Israel is the means. And so the reconciliation is going back, although it's part of the Abrahamic promise, it's going back to Genesis. It's going back to Genesis. We have to see that. It's both and. Yeah. Excellent. Anyone else? Anyone else? Let me let me give it just one. Uh, let me just give one passage of scripture and, and, and we'll, we'll close on this. I, I want, this is my heart. This is my heart. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. This is my prayer for all of us. But our delight is in the law of the Lord. And I can say that. We can say that. <laughs> we can say that. 
Our delight is in the law of the Lord, and on God's law, we meditate day and night. And we will be like a tree planted by the streams of water that produce our fruit, our fruit, genuine righteousness in its season. Our leaf will not wither, and all that we do, we will prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. The wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows our way, but the way of the wicked will perish. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the students. I thank you for their faithfulness. It's been a special semester through all the challenges, through typhoons, through internet, through you know, you know, Lord, you know the struggles in churches here and difficulties. But Father God, we've made it. I pray that the students can finish the last remaining task. I pray that we can start up biblical theology too in the fall. Um, Father God, you know our way, and our way is to dwell with you in your house forever. This is our prayer, and I pray that each student here, we would all have this desire to meditate on your law day and night. So in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen.